Hi boys and girls, it's me Butch. My name is Terry David Silvercloud. I go by Butch, but I go by all my names. So I'm easy to find on the internet. In person, I'm pretty reclusive. I live alone. I'm 73 years old and uh, in my old age, because I have severe arthritis and chronic pain, I try to be useful by working on my art or making videos now to educate you or amuse you. It makes no difference to me. I'm an artist 24-7. My entire life is just one big art project. And because I know it's running out of time really quickly, here I am. So today I am going to try and... Uh, I haven't scripted this. I'm a, I'm a bit ADHD. And I'll go on and on and on like a dripping tap. Um, where was I? See, I lost myself already. <laughs> I haven't scripted this, so I want to talk to you about my theory. Uh, what you're going to, everything I'm going to tell you is my beliefs, and I'll tell you if if I'm not in accordance with something everybody already knows everywhere. I'll let you know that that's my opinion. Not you just got to take my word for it and. Uh, the thing about being a good scientist is that um, you don't overlook anything. You just look at everything. So before I get into uh, exactly what causes the speed of light and what causes gravity, the whole shebang and how they can all be wrapped up in a, a simple kind of a, a mind thought, uh, for this video, you're not going to have to know any uh, any quantum mechanics. It's it's always very useful if you do, because then you can say, oh yeah, that sort of makes sense. Uh, but this is all really basic. You know, if you had high school physics, ballistics, and uh, buoyancy, it would that would be helpful. But if you're just curious, or whether you're uh, a very serious theoretical physicist. Uh, you, you should give this a listen if you're if you're a really good egghead you'll check out everything and say he doesn't know what the age he's talking about but Butchie Poo doesn't give a crap I'm going to tell you my opinion so where was I so theories this is going to be a theory I'm presenting to you and you can test it for yourself because I'll give you my observations and my conclusions and in ways in which the theory can be proven <laughs> it's already happening but we're not noticing uh, where was I? See how I get distracted like that? Um, things like Big Bang Theory, that theory is popular. It's There's lots of dissenters out there, and it's so shot full of holes. I It, it just sort of makes the news, because that's what everybody wants to believe. And it's a very creationist theory, so that problem alone makes it a problem, because it's... It's like having a god, you know, for the religious. Well, that answers everything. No, it doesn't. Like, how did this god get to rule you? Like, where did that god come from? And Big Bang has exactly the same fundamental issue. Well, what came before Big Bang? Uh, well, we're not going to talk about that because we don't know. And, and things like uh, that the universe seems to be expanding from us. One way of explaining that is, is that the Earth itself doesn't actually make what you would call a circle or an ellipse. That never happens. Because nothing ever stands still ever and everything's always on the move all the time. And even as I sit here and you watch this, we are moving at least 230 kilometers per second through the Milky Way. The result of that is, is that the actual path that Earth takes when it's flying through space relative to us, because uh, that's the whole big issue with relativity, is relativity depends upon the relationship between the observed and the observer. Uh, there's a crow out there trying to get my attention, so I'm just going to ignore it for now. Jeez. Bad timing! Um... Where was I? So, the Earth, between, let's say, December 21st and December 21st, one year later, 
makes a helical wave which is about 7 billion kilometers long. So it has a period of 365 and a quarter days and its wavelength is about 7 billion kilometers. That's the wavelength of the path of Earth in relative to our galaxy. We can't know absolute motion and even uh, Sir Isaac Newton, he realized, and if you read his stuff, I haven't read his stuff, but I've, <laughs> let's not get into that. I've studied him a bit because I want to know what he had to say about this. So what he had to say about this was is that all of our all of our measurements, no matter what, no matter how hard we try, will always be relative. And, it, you know, for like being a carpenter on Earth or even navigating, which involves great circle routes and not <laughs> traveling in a circle and in order to get, go the shortest distance. If you want to go across, pilots and, and navigators won't know this, but when I was 22 years old, I was in the Royal Canadian Navy and I was... Uh, the navigator of HMCS Cape Scott. So when I was 22 years old, I was an officer in the Navy and I was navi navigating ships. So things moving all around me in weird ways and me being the guy that's supposed to know where we are because I'm, I'm telling everybody where to go. And I got over 300 lives depending on me knowing where I am and when I'm there. <laughs> so, you know, oops. And, you know, navigators know that getting around the earth you know you have to travel in a in a circular route to go the shortest distance which is just part of ballistics or you kids that have studied ballistics you'll you'll understand it all very perfectly and i do yada 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 so if you give me a second i'll make the crow go away they're nesting they just live over there should have known it's the time of day that they're just nesting up the street there. Where was I? See, now I'm really screwed because I can't remember what the hell I was talking about. Anyhow, uh, Big Bang. Oh, Isaac Newton. Yeah, so even he, before Einstein, he, he realized that uh, everything was relative to something. And for most things, it wouldn't matter. But And then Einstein came along and that's sort of how I got into thinking about all this. When I was back, when I was a, in high school, I had thought that I was going to go off and invent, invent a flat screen TV. I was in high school in the late 50s and early 60s. But I just went straight into the Navy and uh, became an, a naval officer at, by age 19. And then I drove submarines and then I left the Navy. I, have, I had a long life. So I didn't get to be the physicist that I thought I was going to be. And uh, for those of you who don't, don't really know what physics is, it's, uh, it's the study of energy, matter, and motion. Science is knowledge. So if you, if you don't, you are ignorant of knowledge. <laughs> like if you have ignorance, it's of science, basically, because science covers all kinds of things. And I get in the dry mouth, so hang on here. I'm addicted to kefir. <laughs> so, in uh, the world of knowledge, there's a an area where weirdos like me study energy, matter, and motion, and uh, they're the kind of people that want to know what, what is reality made of. They want to stare God in the face and say, what's going on in there? Um, so energy map physics so there's different kinds of physicists and you know people can go to university and they'll get a bachelor or a master's or a PhD and um, you know they're just different levels of knowledge and can get you different kinds of jobs so with a bachelor or a master's you could probably teach uh, high school physics so you just do some 
teaching courses and you could probably get a job teaching science in a high school somewhere. That kind of thing. And then people that get a master's degree, they'd usually go on to do uh, applied physics kind of jobs where there's tons of jobs out there where, you know, in engineering companies and things, uh, or they might even go on to study engineering after they've done physics. And <laughs> you can add degree on to degree, but um, the point is where they need some dude that understands the mathematics that sometimes get involved with physics. So they're sort of applied physicists, and there's lots of them, and quite a few jobs. And then there's theoretical physicists, and there's fewer of them because that requires money, and nobody wants to, <laughs> nobody wants to give it. <laughs> it costs a lot of money. <laughs> big money so you know those kind of jobs are hard to come by and sometimes some of the people who are doing it are doing it for the love of it less than the money because the money isn't in proportion to what they should be getting for what they're doing and I diverse but in the world of physics there are theories and Big Bang is uh, one of them and I I think it's a silly creationist theory because like the theory of God, you can't explain what came before it. Universal expansion, oh, that's how I got off on talking about Earth going through space. See? See how the ADH mind works? Um, we are always moving towards the center of our galaxy at a rate of about 230 kilometers per second. So no matter what, we are moving in the world of physics to get further away from the center of anything requires more <laughs> energy. So we are sort of losing energy a bit as we're coming to a, we don't have to be going so fast to keep up as we move towards the center area of, of the galaxy. So from our perception, electromagnetically, everything is always moving away from us, except the center of the Milky Way, which should be seeming well, it's it's it takes a long time because we're we're sort of we're sort of a big disc going through space. You should start thinking of galaxies as uh, giant hurricanes in space, but because there is no real up or down, they could be any which way. But invariably, you'll see they like being flattened out on the edges, and and that's an indication of spin, and they are spinning and. Uh, uh, they may be going through space like a, uh, you know, a frisbee for all we know, but uh, we should assume that galaxies are areas in space of uh, great motion, like tornadoes, hurricanes, and that big clouds are areas more of relative quiet. You know, there's less, if there was a disturbance going on there, it's not particularly happening now. So Big Bang, you know, people say, well, everything's going away, which was a prediction. <laughs> I should tell you, in 2017, a, a black hole so massive and so far away was discovered that it nullifies Big Bang automatically by its mere existence. So that's an, if we didn't need a proof, that's a pretty good proof. The other thing is Big Bang doesn't explain what came before. And what's the other thing? Oh, redshift. That is fairly relatively explained because no matter where light is coming from to us, it'll always eventually get redshift. And that's because the further away a source of energy is, the more diversions it's had to take to get there because energy always moves towards the denser medium. And suns and galaxies are full of stuff you may not see, but in spite of anything you think is gravity, they would bend towards them anyway because that's an area, uh, it's, it's sort of like a bird going, you know, using the airwaves to, <laughs> to get yourself on the way. And there's a rule in physics that longest is strongest. And what that means is the greater energy lies in the long wave. And it's extremely hard for a very short wave to uh, match that. It can only do it in amplitude like a that was a very short wave but if I was to lift this entire table up that would require a very long wave so it's like a, a tsunami may only be five feet high but if it keeps coming at you for the next 24 hours 
you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> Serious trouble. It just doesn't stop. It's only five feet tall, but it just won't stop. So it, what's happened is you're, you are now in a river that's not turning off with a lot of energy behind it. So where was I? Um, so redshift is easily explained by the simple fact that light, the further something is away, it, it's going to lose more and more and more of its blue light energy. It should just by the mere physics of it. So I'm going on on like a dripping tap in about the 15 minutes. And uh, so I'm not into things like Big Bang. And, and you need to know it's it's only a, a popular theory and, and not a proven one. And Einstein, I what got me going in 2004 that got me to think in the way I do today, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight. Um, I, I asked myself, what, do, what would it take to be here and there at the same time? And things like that and I realized the same as Einstein did it it was just some adjusting some basic mathematical formulae for areas of a circle or the volume of a sphere so if you if you can travel at four thirds pi c cubed for any given amount of time you can occupy that sphere all at once everywhere at the same time but you would have to exceed the speed of light by four thirds pi c cubed so when I realized that, it got me onto other things. And then a couple of years ago, I, I, I could never, uh, I could never answer the question about the electron. And I think the crow is just going to keep bugging me until I. Hang on. something down, I don't remember where I put it. This little doodle land right up here. Yeah, there's three, three nesting families within several hundred meters of me. Oh, that's probably the main. Anyhow, I don't have time for that. Uh, so I realized something about an electron and uh, that made me realize that the electron had to set the speed of light and I started asking myself questions about how fast is fast, how big is big, how small is small and and realize that like if you lived on a carbon atom you couldn't even know what light is. It would be too large. It would just be a gravity wave to you. It would be so big. And that something had to cause a speed of light and I came to these sudden realizations sometimes come to people like me who think about this kind of stuff all the time that we ignore electrons and, and they outnumber there's only three main particles in reality there's a whole bunch of other bits and pieces but when you do the main counting the ones you're interested in are the electrons, the protons and the neutrons and it's shown that neutrons will decay to a proton and an electron so really every neutron counts uh, as a proton plus it loses its vote because there was an electron in there already. Electrons by number, even though they're much, much smaller than either protons or neutrons, fire out number protons and neutrons. And, and you know, if you get the gang together, they might be a bunch of little squirts, but they can do some serious damage when they all get together all at once all the time. So... I got thinking a lot about electrons and what causes resistance and then the, th the problems that, you know, ancient Greek mathematicians had about um, what is the smallest shape, you know, like you start looking at tetrahedrons and you realize that you cannot tile the universe with tetrahedrons. It, it doesn't work because it's the shape, yet it's still the shape that um, is, has the fewest pointy things and the fewest surfacey things. And if you're going to make something really small, you would think you'd want it to be spherical. And and that that's like the God problem. Where did God come from? Spheres to mathematicians are just <laughs> zillions of little points. Now you've got to explain all those zillions of points. So when you run out of all other explanations for any kind of pointy pointies, um, a tetrahedron comes to mind. And then the next thing that's best after that is a shape that looks sort of like a pup tent where all the sides are equal. It's an equilateral prism. So 
it's like a pup tent where the crossbar is a one and the two bars going down there one and there's a square so you combine uh, on surface areas you combine both a tetrahedron and a square and and it's a shape that is much better at filling the universe even than a, the tetrahedron could be so you start thinking oh there's some shapes that there's only one of them no matter what Mathematic, math, the weirdo math types will get it. Mathematics, the beauty of it is that <laughs> there's always one special star and only it can do it no matter how many other numbers there are. And a problem with uh, Big Bang Theory is it doesn't allow for, well, what's out there? Is there such a thing as absolute nothingness? And, and that's just not logical. You just have to give up the idea that there's edges anywhere and, and that reality is infinite and the only reality that really exists is from your point of view anyway so why do you give a crap and stop worrying about dying because you're going to die and just try and do something useful while you're here and stop destroying the planet that's what I'm trying to do where was I? 21 minutes gee she talks a lot doesn't he? I go on and on so uh, haven't got. Oh, I, I want to get back to electrons. So, I was studying electrons and thinking, well, a sphere. They, because I believe that sub, as above, so below, and, and vice versa, and that time and size are where relative, where relativity is involved. Einstein's idea of because you could catch up to the speed of light would cause time things to warp. That was just bad navigation. That you can't allow time to be a variable because then nothing makes sense. And there's infinite answers. It's just, it must have disturbed. Well, see, when, when he wrote his 1916 Relativity, he had a dude standing by a railroad track and another dude riding the, the railroad carriage. And, and he talked about how they would view flashes of lightning in front of them and behind them and you know if, if they were both sort of the same distance you know the math gets weird when you start talking about the speed of light and then he started getting lost in as some poor navigators can do in the time warp and tried to explain it by time adjusting but atomic clocks do vary depending on seemingly where they are and how fast they're moving and and Einstein's equations actually can work for warping the time for them quite often but that's always relative to earth and, and, and Einstein ignored absolute motion he didn't consider energy coming from the sides he didn't even get into waves because waves were all brand new at the time and he ignored Doppler effect he ignored uh, any motion considered absolute motion and tried to fix it by always talking about the inertial frame and and as long as you remember that <laughs> when you get the answer you, you weren't where you were when you started to get the answer so things start looking a little weird to you well of course they are you move through space and it's going to look different now so it can sort of work that way but he he just didn't ignore he wasn't even thinking about the fact that earth doesn't actually make a circle. He even in the E equals M C square kind of thing, that's on a flat plane and that's all very nice if you're trying to measure a, you know, what kind of force is going to come from one direction or how it's going to spread out over a flat surface, but uh, you start ignoring the, the down and the up and there's more to it. That's where the four thirds pi C cube thing, if you can see the similarities where I say like how fast you have to go to be here there and everywhere for a given time and the answer is four thirds pi c cube it's just basic math when you start to think about it uh, basic sort of uh, solid geometry uh, I'm not going to get into math don't want to confuse up to 24 minutes he does yak 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 so I'm thinking about the electron and uh, in the past year I came to realize that it causes the speed of light. I had something out I was going to show you. Oh, there it is. Oops. Hope that didn't hurt. Did that hurt? 
in to make a long story short because I'll probably never stop talking otherwise and I'm probably going to go on and on anyway I had to come up with a shape for an electron to be a particle and what would be the toughest little mother mom doesn't like that kid <laughs> boy on the block the real Bart Simpson of the of the electronic world um, what sort of shape would that little tough person be and you would like it to be a tetrahedron but tetrahedrons have all kinds of issues that um, this didn't work for me and then I had one of these insights that I suddenly seemed to have and I thought I'm thinking about shapes again and unique shapes where there's just certain special shapes that are terrific and I may have been inspired by hearing about the fact that using the detonator of your your low-grade <laughs> atomic bombs and probably the current ones the shape is almost universally a, a, an icosahedron and the reason for that is you can separate the critical mass into at least 20 parts and uh, even if all of them, and you can just, the way an atomic bomb works is you just hold together a critical mass of, of fissionable uranium, which is, takes some serious work to get that stuff. You can't get it. You, get, you have to have serious brains to get that stuff. But that's the theory. You hold it together for a certain period of time until a chain reaction happens, and then it just goes kablooey. And a hydrogen bomb, you just encase the whole thing in hydrogen, and the heat from the nuclear explosion causes fusion in the hydrogen so it's like two bombs in one <laughs> very efficient they have them down to the size they worked them out i think even by the time of the vietnam war where a, a single man could carry one on his back think about that folks hey yeah, where was i so it turns out i overlooked the alleyway that um this shape here see it this is a icosahedron and it is 20 tetrahedrons all sharing a common apex that means that oh happy day in mathematics they 20 individual shapes share what in mathematics is called a singularity a singularity one of the problems with a singularity is that it it can't have spin unless it unless it exists in time and then it has to become a wave and <laughs> it's all very mathematically very turn your mind to rubber stuff so singularities are all very useful on blackboards and we use them all the time because they're very convenient <laughs> it's like it's like wearing a tracking device we know where you are <laughs> you're over there <laughs> so and, you know, that's sort of, in a way, what happens when they bash protons together and see what comes out. And you're really just track, tracking the, the, the death throw of, 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 a, of a particle that seemingly comes in and out of existence. It was just, in physics, nothing is ever created or destroyed. It just changes form, so it just from the human's point of view it just passed out of existence and probably re-emerged was absorbed somewhere by an atom as a oh I'll have that to eat and it was gone that's the way these things work where was I? so I decided that about a year ago now that uh, electrons that would be a terrific shape because it would allow for a smaller particle which I call gamma particles because gamma rays are they act like particles so they probably are uh, and if they're particles they they really need to have a shape and it should be really effing tough and a tetrahedron is really effing tough um, so if you took 20 gamma particles and and they all shared a common apex they would become an, an icosahedron. And if you assume that the reason that the gamma particles took the shape of the tetrahedron in the first place, 
was it was the smallest from our perception point of view shape it could be it could be a zillion other things but by any way we could possibly recognize their time which time a second to us would be like their entire lifetime that's a long time if you're really small we're we're just a really convenient size in in the universe we're big enough to be big enough and small enough to say what the hell is going on out there and being a physicist i'm trying to figure out what's going on and i'm trying to tell you now what's going on so all of this stuff that i'm thinking about this is really convenient because everybody's coming to the conclusion yeah 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 we the only thing that makes sense is dark matter i mean give it a break it's there <laughs> what is it and dark energy and what is the difference between dark energy and dark matter well it to on our size level it, it doesn't really happen you're passing your body through it all the time and your body is it's just there it's filling everything but it's it's so small we have nothing to with which to detect it we detect everything with electrons electron microscopes beams of electrons old tv sets used to spew a beam of electrons at a piece of glass coated with phosphorus and draw lines there would be a thing called the horizon the way a tv worked was 525 lines in north america and the electron gun with magnets would go doop, 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 525 times and uh, and and do that about 30 times a second and that's why you thought you were seeing a motion picture so we've been using electrons and, and even for you to see me the way you're seeing me is electrons are sending information from your eye nerves and your ear nerves to the stoned out person sitting at the desk up here and on the big screen there where the captain's in his big his or her reclining chair looking at the big screen saying wow this dude's weird i am <laughs> yeah i am weird i am really smart i'm i am weird and i don't know why i am i, I just accept it now it's my fate who cares maybe it, let's not get into that so where was i see i totally lost my train of thought so nothing in our reality can get to your brain except by way of an electron that's why the physical electron its actual size like if i get i get myself an orb here See, like if, if this if this is an electron here nothing can get from here to there unless this electron gets out of the way rolls some if you're smaller than this electron the electron is going to say where are you going buddy and i've been a bouncer i didn't act that way uh, they just looked at me and they uh is that I ain't messing with him so if there were little gamma particles I'll get another ball here to show you I'm using spheres but pretend that this is a tetrahedron the yellow thing is a tetrahedron and this is an icosahedron so it's got 20 triangular antennae on its surface aimed in every direction in all directions because in it so it can spin uh, but we're going to get to something else that the spin doesn't associate with so anyhow if you're a gamma and you want to come along and you want to get past this uh, this electron the electron is going to say well buddy you can roll around if you want or you can bring back a bunch of your buddies and push me if you want but you ain't going but you ain't going nowhere that's a pesky crow isn't it so you're getting the idea here that if there's if you start thinking about the laws of buoyancy and how things are affected just in buoyancy you can see how in a structured universe if there was something smaller than the electron it it could be the solid stuff of the dark matter 
what would be smaller than it? The stuff it's made of. And we're not going to see them unless we can see in gamma. And we're getting better at that, but all we do is shadow imaging. Like we, we beam gamma rays through things. It's kind of like an x-ray. But they're getting better at that. Uh, maybe, maybe that'll happen. Uh, I'll probably be uh, dead by the time they do it. But I would imagine that um, three-dimensional um, gamma ray scanning is within we should have three-dimensional gamma ray scanning within five years. I, I can't see why not. Uh, we we have we have the technology to uh, create gamma rays. It takes a lot of energy to do it, and it's extraordinarily dangerous. But well, that's where I put that. I put that right there. So. Uh, I don't know what they're doing. There's a pair of crows up the street, and then there's another one behind the house there. Um, it, it, it leads you to wonder when we're generating gamma rays, because although we sort of know how to do it, I'm not quite sure why is that happening. <laughs> and it might be that and the way it's done is by blasting high-energy electron beams at certain types of metals at particular angles, that's one way of doing it, if you want a, a burst, like a, a good burst of gamma rays. So what, where are the gamma rays coming from? You know, so if we started thinking of gamma rays as dark matter, <laughs> on that level of reality, then it might be that some of the electrons that are hitting the metal are actually flying apart. They, if they were made of gamma particles, they could fly apart. Uh, but one of the things we know, and this is an observation which anybody can test and should just be common knowledge, is electrons repel themselves. Protons, they're happy to be close together. No, they're not, you know, it helps if there's a neutron there for every proton. But they're not uncomfortable being amongst themselves. But electrons, they like, they... They gather in little villages on shells, and it's like, get away from me, this is, this is my area later for you, dude. And they're tough little suckers, and the, uh, uh, the further out they are from the center, which is to them an area of rest, the tougher they have to be to be there, because they got to fly really fast, and whether they want to or not, because the center of rest is always going to be at the center of any sphere. <coughs> Where was I? I forgot. I totally forgot where I am. Um, anyhow, the basis of my theory here is, is that um, the electron by its physical nature i got to wrap this up. This is going on forever. Is, is that the electron takes this shape and that when the smaller, more fundamental... Oh, oh that's what I was talking about. Good, I'll get back to it because this is really important. The thing you know about electrons, and everybody knows, is they repel each other and they don't want to be near each other. That's what I was talking about. The only possible way, mathematically, no matter how you put it together, use your imagination here, whether it's a... You would say, well, that's kind of hard to do with a sphere, but it's like really easy to do with this. You know it's a monopole. Your observation said it's a monopole. Well, how? Because we know it has spin, left spin, right spin. You can move it. You can control it. It's, it's, it can generate magnetism, and it can be controlled by magnetism. And if magnetism was simply manipulation of 
the gamma, which is the dark matter, then gamma, oops, gamma, if they were exactly the same as, you see the little triangular faces? Well, the gamma, they are gamma. Those things are gamma. So if another gamma lined up with it, it would either become part of a building block like really rapidly or uh, be doing its best to push or be part of part of the rock and roll. So we have to assume that the gamma particles, and I think we can be pretty sure they are through testing with magnets already, that they react to magnetism as well. And probably the reason that's happening is of their fixed pole structure. Now the the icosahedron, it has 20 surfaces and 20 vertices, so it could have 10 different poles, which it could just flip quite easily. But a gamma would have only one, two, three, four poles from which to choose. So if it was the, the fundamental thing that's trying to be something, and, and just get away from me, kind of be something, trying to push the universe back, which begs the question, is there absolute nothingness? It's, it's just a state of reality. No matter how far you go, you'll have to assume that the universe is fractal, and if there is something there, and why we care at this point, it's more theoretical than for practical reasons, that it will continue down until your concept of time changes. Because when things get that extraordinarily small, even a billionth of a second would be an extraordinarily long time at that size of reality. This is where Einstein went wrong when you're speeding up and slowing down. See, we view everything with electrons. We have no choice because of our electronic structure, electronic universe, to do everything at the speed of light. We have no choice. So I don't know if I covered everything I was going to, but I don't want to go over 45 minutes. I'm definitely going, yeah, okay, 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 okay. Um, I'll probably make more videos like this because I'm really trying to spread the concept of people thinking about the physical characteristics characteristics of the electron being the ruler by which we think light speed happens and that all things to us are relative anyway and it would be helpful if you remember the earth nothing ever goes in a circle everything everything's going in some kind of wave even isaac newton admitted we can't know absolute motion we can't know absolute time so when Einstein starts twisting our relative time once again with his his notions, things are bound to go astray, and they did. He just did not consider Doppler shift and that energy levels change. That's what happens. When the waves start hitting you faster, you are gaining energy, and, and it's just an energy transference in the universe, and Einstein didn't even uh, consider that one. Butch Poo is going to shut up now. Electrons cause the speed of light, Butch says so. Uh, you don't have to believe a thing I said, but I think if you start wrapping your minds around some of it or watch this again, if you can put up with me or check us on my other videos, you'll see that that really makes sense when you start thinking about it. That the fractal reality of time and, and matter and relative everything is relative no two people the poly principle says no be in the same place at the same time you know the, the solid things so it's no two people can experience the same reality at the same time and they'll 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 swear they did but they didn't it's not possible just because the angle of view like you're seeing you're seeing what you see behind here and whatever I'm doing, uh, and I'm about 45 minutes, so Butchie Poo, who's a 73-year-old visual artist living in Vancouver, who may seem a bit wacko, and the psychiatrist said, you're perfectly normal, you're just, 
a bit out there. <laughs> Bye.